Hello and welcome to your class today. I know it's weird that I'm on the bus, but unfortunately, that's the only way I could do it. I don't live alone, so for me to sit in the home office and do this early in the morning before I leave, I would wake up the entire house. I live in a small apartment in Ranheim. There are only two bedrooms and a tiny little room where I have the computer where I normally teach your classes from. And that is right next to the master bedroom. And I didn't want to wake up anyone. So I decided I'll just do it on the bus. And I know everyone's probably sitting there thinking, Pollyanna, why in the world are you on the bus to Selbu today when we're having homeschool? Well, I made a big federal case about this bus running. I made a petition. I had the mayor of Selbu and the principal of the main high school in Selbu signed the petition. I nagged all my friends all over the world to sign it. So I have to take it, right? So I try to take it three times a week. I know that right now with the new order of things, it is probably a good solution for some of the teachers not to be at the school. Perhaps for more space in the office for the others so everyone doesn't have to sit so close to one another. But enough about me. I can go on and on and on and on, but enough. Here's your book. We're doing chapter five. Chapter five is an awesome chapter in my opinion, because it is so me, and I feel like I can teach it in my sleep. English teachers, they have that thing about English speaking countries. They get overly excited about any chapter that is about that. This entire chapter explores, it's kind of difficult to open the book and hold the computer so it won't fall and break. But here I am. So this entire chapter is about English around the world. So the last class that I talked to you girls about this, we were on these two pages right here. And cultural affairs is the entire, is what the entire chapter is about. Cultural affairs. We discussed some of the keywords on page 163. Maybe I'll hold the computer and I'll have the book on there, on that thing. Yeah, so it's not bumpy. So people don't get car, seat, car sick taking this class. All right, so we already talked about pages 162 and 163. And now page 165, English, a world language. Before you start, match these words with the correct Norwegian translation. The first one, mother tongue. The second one, second language. How appropriate. Second one, second language. Number three, foreign language. Number four, official language. Number five, lingua franca. And here you have the Norwegian possibilities. 
fremed sprak, mors mal, officielt sprak, felle sprak, andre sprak. Let me explain something to you about the concept of second language and foreign language. Usually when I tell people that I teach English as a foreign language, they ask me, isn't English the second language in Norway? It isn't. English is a foreign language in Norway. If you go into If you go into a store, if you go into a medical office, if you go anywhere, chances are people will know English. But as you may have noticed, most people who are of a certain age are not very good at English because back in the day, when your grandparents, I'm going to say your great grandparents, when your great grandparents were going to school in Norway, they probably took German or French and English was not such a big deal. The younger people are, the better they are at English. But there is a false sense of being good at English here in Norway because a lot of people speak to communicate and to get their message across, but their grammar is not so great. Their grammar has a lot of flaws and you're not gonna be one of those people. You're gonna be people who will write good academic English. You will speak proper English. You will be awesome. So, not everybody has to speak English in Norway, although it is widely taught in schools. Although a lot of people know it, it is still not a second language here. You have two languages in Norway, Norwegian and Samisk. Those are the official languages. English is not. So, foreign language, fremedesprok. Second language, let me give you an example of a country where English is the second language. India. In India, English is the second language. People are bilingual in India. They are required to be. In Norway, for example, when you go to junior high, and by junior high, I'm talking about 8th, ninth, and 10th grade, because this is the equivalent to your junior high here, you have some options. You can take English, or you can take Norwegian you can take AP Norwegian, which is Norsk for Dupning. Instead of taking a foreign language, some people are exempt from taking English. Perhaps with the new movement towards changing how languages are taught here in Norway, there is a high likelihood that English will be more and more important. The foreign languages will be perhaps not as important as English. English, Spanish, French, Italian, some, some high schools have Italian, but English is more of a requirement as a matter of fact, oh, look how beautiful it is. Isn't this awesome? I feel privileged to live in Norway. I'm not rich. I don't have a car here. 
when I was in Brazil, I had a car. I had probably a higher standard of life in Brazil than here. I didn't have to take the bus. I lived in a very big apartment. I had, it's, it's kind of interesting that my life in Norway is not as comfortable as it was in Brazil. I would never have to take a bus to go anywhere if I had been living there. But I feel privileged living here even under all the circumstances, because this is a good country in many ways. So I was talking about languages. So here in Norway, you all speak Norwegian. You learn English in school. And as of eighth grade, you can choose yet another language. So you are all very privileged to have this opportunity because that's not how it is in many other countries. And the quality of your English education at school is way above the standards of other countries. For starters, because you have English from first grade all the way until high school. That is a good 12 years of English. So it is very appropriate. Let me see if I can hold the book and hold the computer at the same time. Okay. It's very appropriate that we're discussing this. English a world language. And when you look at this picture, when you look at this picture on page 164, you have four people of different ethnicities. You have on the very top, you have someone of African descent and you have a Caucasian boy. You have a girl who could be Latina, could be Middle East, Eastern, the one with a cowboy hat. And you have a, an Indian girl. And the only reason why I'm saying Indian is because of what she's wearing. And she has a typical Indian outfit on. English, a world language. So I'm going to give you the answers to that first exercise that is called Before You Read. Mother tongue, number one, mushmol. So number one, letter B. Number two, second language, Andres Brock, letter E. Number three, foreign language, Fremedes Brock, letter A. Number four, official language, Officiel Sprock, letter C. And five, Lingua Franca, Lingua Franca, Feles Sprock. So here, English, a world language. This is by far my favorite chapter in this entire book. And for that reason, I would like you girls to perhaps give it a shot when you're choosing the text for your I'm going to call it an interview, but it was intended to be an oral presentation. But since I got requests from everyone to drop it and do something else because you felt like you would have to prepare, 
and do a lot of work and you have already done so much so we're switching things up a bit but you're still getting graded and all you're going to do is choose a text you don't have to prepare it you don't have to write anything down about it you just have to read it you're gonna sit with me within a meter distance since we're doing the social distancing thing still if I'm at school I don't know if I'm gonna be allowed back at school but if I am at school we'll sit you will sit somewhere with me within a meters distance and you're going to talk about one of the texts in this chapter I would like you to choose a I would like you to choose a chapter from this book if I if I could influence you a little bit but you can choose any chapter on the book and you will read it out loud for me you'll read it I'll correct your pronunciation I will assess your pronunciation I will give you a grade for pronunciation for how fluent your reading is and then we're going to talk about that text and you can have the book open in front of you and you can answer the questions and talk about your opinions about the text you can choose any text on the book from units one to five which are the units that were covered throughout this year the school year but my suggestion would be a chapter from, I'm sorry, a text from chapter five, English, a world language. So here we have the very beginning of this text on page 165. It starts like this. Have you ever visited a place where nobody could communicate in English? Probably not. Maybe the people you met did not speak English very well, but most likely they could give you some information about where you could find the nearest bus stop, for example. In most places today, at least young people know a little bit of English. In fact, you will manage by using your hands and some English no matter where you are in the world. This, however, has not always been the case. I want to point out to you that some countries are not like that at all if you go to Brazil for example only about 5% of the population is fluent in English is not that insane so I feel very privileged to have grown up part of my life in the United States to have studied in countries like the United States and Australia and New Zealand and that's how I was able to speak English well and I went to a binational center as a school when I went back to Brazil so I learned but most people in Brazil don't speak it so if you go to Brazil you could possibly use some of your knowledge of Spanish to communicate with people because Portuguese is a similar language to to Spanish but you might have difficulties trying to communicate with people in English because most people don't don't speak it page 166 I'm already in Stjordal welcome to Stjordal this is a city in Norway. I've been here a few times, but I don't really know it that well. I'm not going to lie, I've only been to the train station, and I went to visit a friend once. Oh, and I went to a congress for teachers once. So welcome to Stjordal. I hope you have a pleasant stay. Okay, all kidding set aside, page 166, the origin of English. I'm reading this stuff to you because I can't play the audio file on the bus. 
Can you imagine playing the audio file on the bus out loud? The origin of English. It is only quite recently that English has become the world language. It is today. 1,500 years ago, the language did not even exist. I can't even imagine a world without English, since English is such a tremendous part of my life. It is my favorite language. Number one, English. Number two, Portuguese. Then Spanish. And then Norwegian. I struggle to speak Norwegian. I mean, I speak it. But it's like aerobics for my face. Ooh. Mm. Ooh. I'm never going to be perfect at it. But I'm never going to stop trying. And I want you to take on the same attitude with English. As your English teacher, I advise you to always keep trying. So, 1500 years ago, English did not exist. I would not want to live in a world where English did not exist. What do you mean English did not exist? Well, it didn't, didn't exist. When the Anglo-Saxons invaded and settled in the British Isles around 500 AD, their Germanic mother tongue became the foundation for Old English. Around 800 AD, the Vikings, you guys, Vikings, started raiding England and in 1066, the Normans invaded the country. This changed the language. Almost 10% of English words come from Old Norse and 30% from French. Consequently, English is the result of people meeting and interacting, though not always in peaceful ways. What do you think they mean by that? though not always in peaceful ways. See, here's the station. Stradal Station. What do you think they mean by that? If you just wrote in the chat box, war, you are right. I will be sitting with you live and direct, typing in the chat, participating in reading what you have to say throughout the class. There will be a live premiere with this video. So war, there were lots of wars historically. Historically speaking, the wars brought a lot of destruction, but the interactions between people, they fundamentally influence how people spoke languages. The spread of English. In the late 1500s, when Shakespeare wrote his famous plays, everyone knows who Shakespeare is, right? Please tell me you do. Just humor me and put in the chat box. I want to see five Shakespearean plays, sonnets, anything that you know, quotes, Shakespearean quotes. So I'm already, I'm going to look at the timer and within the next 30 seconds, in the next 30 seconds, I expect to see Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Midsummer Night's Dream, at least Othello. I'm expecting somebody to write something like a Shakespearean, a very, very, very famous Shakespearean. Are you familiar with the soliloquy in Hamlet? To be or not to be. That is Shakespeare. As a matter of fact, a lot of people talk about it without knowing they're quoting Shakespeare to be or not to be that is the question that 
a lot of people may not realize has something to do with living. To live or to die, to be or not to be. So contemplating suicide, young Hamlet started asking himself whether he wanted to live or die. As a matter of fact, there's internet on this bus. So I don't know if it's any good, but I'm going to pull the entire soliloquy and I'll read it for you. I was going to try to just say it off the top of my head, but I I didn't want to make a mistake. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation, devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Hey, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. When we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the presses wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the worthy takes when he himself might his quiet as make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and swear under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. The conscious thus make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with a pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pitch and moment with disregard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. You can, I'm not going to take um, each and every verse of it to translate and explain, but I will give you the gist. When Shakespeare here, through the mouth of Hamlet, speaks the word of we are cowards if we stay because we're not, we're not brave enough to end our lives because we don't know what's beyond death. That's what he's talking about in the soliloquy. A soliloquy is a bit different from a monologue. And to understand it, it's more like um, a monologue. You can understand it in simple terms if you think of a monologue compared to a dialogue. Right? So, monologue, mono, one, one person, one person talking. A dialogue, two people talking, right? And a conversation can be a group of people. So, in the sense that he's talking, and he's, only, he's the only one talking, you would call it a monologue. But it is, in fact, to be or not to be, that part of the play Hamlet, written by Shakespeare, is considered a soliloquy. I'm going to try to find um, a good definition for you, perhaps in Norwegian, to explain to you.
We can't talk about the origins of English without mentioning Shakespeare. So if you think it's boring, I'm sorry. I really am. But we're going to do it. A soliloquy, an act of speaking one's thoughts aloud when by oneself or regardless of any hearers, especially by a character in a play. So a soliloquy is within a play. And here you can even find, this is a dictionary definition that you yourself can Google and, can Google and find, but it says that some words can be similar to it. Monologue, which is what I was talking about before, is also similar. Speech, lecture, oration, sermon, those are similar, but not the same. So a soliloquy is a part. In a play, usually a character will be uttering his or her thoughts to himself or maybe to a bunch of people, but he's not really talking to anyone but himself. I'm going to... I want you to actually go and YouTube it. YouTube Homelet to be or not to be. So you can find different versions of movies or plays and you can see different actors performing that part. It is a superb piece of literature and I get tremendously excited by this type of thing. I live for this. Okay. So here, the definition of a monologue, according to the dictionary, is that a monologue means just a long and typically tedious speech. Tedious is just another word for boring. By one person during a conversation. While a soliloquy means the act of speaking one's thoughts aloud when by oneself or regardless of any hearers. A soliloquy is a character making a speech, usually when alone. And Hamlet was a young man and he was having a crisis with himself. He didn't know if he wanted to live or die. So that is the reason why he had that moment and he started to talk about is it better to stay alive and suffer and be brave and go through all the troubles of life or am I going to be a braver person to die and end it all not knowing what's beyond death so that's pretty deep and imagine that those words were written such a long time ago and they are still very relevant today. You will see that a lot of people struggle with depression, with solitude, with panic, with being misunderstood. So this is very current, although Shakespeare lived so many years ago. His themes, everything he brings in his plays, in his sonnets, the words spoken through his characters, they're all very current. Well, I'm going to see if I can get the little um, hell plague in the back so that I can show everyone that I have to go through hell every day before going to work. Going through a little town called hell. Here is Hell Center. I'm going to be incredibly angry if I can't get the word anywhere. Let me see. So there is a city in Norway called Hell. And to go to Selbu to teach, my bus goes through Hell. See how dedicated I am that I would go through hell 
just to teach this class. Well, today I didn't really need to go, but I need to be on the bus. But that's another story. I don't think I'm going to get it on any... Oh, there's a, a sign here, a street sign that says, Hell, there. Bummer. I don't think I'm going to get it anywhere. Well, well, trust me, I am going through hell right now. So, the topic of the chapter, Cultural Affairs, talks about English, a world language. And we cannot talk about... Oh, there it is, hell. There it is, it says hell. I'm going through hell, teaching Shakespeare on a bus. It doesn't get any more surreal than this. Welcome to the incredible life of Pollyanna. I could really write a, a mini series about my life, or maybe a long soap opera. I don't know if people will watch it, but there's enough drama and adventure in my life. Perhaps not so much this part of my life, not so much adventure, but lots of interesting things. So let's keep talking about. English as a world language. I took the liberty of stopping to talk a bit about the soliloquy to be or not to be by Shakespeare because I feel like when people think of Shakespeare nowadays, maybe a lot of people only know about Romeo and Juliet. Maybe a lot of people only know about this they say to be or not to be, but they don't know where it comes from. And if you didn't before, now you do. So the spread of English. In the late 1500s, Shakespeare wrote his famous plays, including Hamlet, which is the play where to be or not to be comes from. However, in the 17th century, the British started exploring the world and went on to establish colonies in, for example, North America, Australia, India, and parts of Africa. They introduced English as the language of communication. Gradually, it became a lingua franca, which could be used to communicate across language barriers. In most of the former colonies, English is still an official language often alongside other native languages. And this was before, years and years ago. Nowadays, it is all about America. Why am I saying this? Anybody can deny they can hate America and they can say this and that, but let's face it. If you're watching the Big Bang Theory, if you're playing video games like GTA or perhaps my references are a little off but you're listening to American music you're playing American video games you're probably trying to speak with an American accent even without noticing it so there's a lot of American influence in the world I myself I have I'm biased and by biased, I mean, because I love the United States so much, I can't really talk about it without having a little bit of love in my heart for the country. Because I have a fondness, if you will, for America. But America has influenced English a lot. Let's talk about it. According to the book first, I know you might think I'm a crazy person wearing gloves on the bus, but I'm, I'm sorry. I am freaked out about the coronavirus situation. Um, I'm not too freaked out that I'm not going to leave the house or anything. I want to go back to the classroom and teach, but I want to be sure that I'm safe and that everyone's safe. But I am freaked out and, and afraid. I'm not going to lie. So that's why I'm wearing gloves. American influence. In 1783, the British colonies in North America formed a union and became the USA. 
From the 1900s on onwards, American political and cultural influence grew steadily. This process also played a very important role in spreading the English language. Today, Hollywood films, television, and the internet are examples of how American culture and language reach people all over the world. Actually, it is estimated that 5 billion people use some English every day through, for example, music, films, or online news. And I know, I know that all you girls watch Netflix. I know that when you watch Netflix, a lot of the series that you watch are in English. And some of those series are in American English. I know. I know you all love, love Grey's Anatomy, American English. So there is a great influence of American English in the world. We can't deny it. Um, I know that not everyone loves Trump or everything that he stands for. So there are some things that we may not like about the United States, but we cannot deny the influence of American culture. And that is something we can talk about when we have our interview. Fog some tall, eh? So it's still an oral grade that you will get from that. Just that you don't need to be worried about writing a script for it. You don't need to worry about writing another essay to present. You'll just sit with me if we're in class within a meter distance. Or we can do it online if I'm not allowed back into the school, if the schedule is... Because I don't know what's going on. I think there's probably not enough office space for all the teachers to sit comfortably within a meter's distance between them. I also told them that I was nervous about coming back, but it didn't mean I wasn't coming back. I was just nervous. Language of business and technology. Did you girls know there is a set of courses that you can take once you graduate? You can study business here in Norway and take the entire course of studies in English. As a matter of fact, you are required to be very good at English to even enter the program. A few months ago, I gave you girls the opportunity to take the TOEIC, the listening section of the TOEIC, Test of English for International Communication. That test tests your ability to communicate in English for the purposes of work, business, and travel, and everyday situations. There is another test TOEFL, the test of English as a foreign language, which is for admission into college, master degree programs. There are proficiency English exams called the Michigan proficiency exam, the Cambridge. There are lots of very important exams that you can take if you want to study and take one of those courses that are entirely in English. So to go to business school, you must know English as well. See, I'm just giving you all sorts of reasons why you should keep studying English and get good at it. I'm very proud of this group. I think you're all tremendously talented at English. You all make a tremendous effort. You have been wonderful doing your assignments, showing up for my YouTube classes. I know it wasn't easy. I am afraid the battery of this computer is going to die. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this up and you will... I want you to really choose a chapter that you like and pick a text that you like for you to read out loud for me in our Fog Somtala. It's not in our presentation. 
It's a fog somtale. You don't need to prepare anything in advance. You just need to show up either online or in person within a meter's distance. Read out loud and talk with me. Talk to me. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you feel about the text that you read. And I'm also going to ask you some questions about the subject this year, what you thought about the school year in English with me and how it was with a book, with everything that we studied, writing an essay, everything that you learned, and that will be it. So please, for today, you will read pages 166 and 167, and that's it. And I'll see you all on Monday. I don't know if I'll be doing a, a video from the bus again. It's beautiful, isn't it? The trip to Selby. I'm not going to lie. I normally sleep all the way there. I'm only staying awake because I had to do this. So everyone, read pages 166 and 167. And please start thinking about which text you want to read out loud during your Fog Samtale with me. Goodbye.